In this video, we'll go over the answers to questions 16 to 18 of the 2020 New South Wales HSC Chemistry Exam. Question 16 states, compounds X, Y, and Z are in equilibrium. The diagram shows the effects of temperature and pressure on the equilibrium yield of compound Z. Below this statement, we see a yield versus temperature plot with three constant pressure curves at 10, 30, and 50 megapascals with temperature on the X axis and yield on the Y axis. The question is then, which equation would be consistent with this data? This is followed by four reversible reactions showing different combinations of X, Y, and Z gas molecules, with Z always one of the products. We also see an indication of the delta H, or change in enthalpy, as being greater than or less than zero for each of the equations. To begin, we remember that whenever there is a change to the conditions of a system at equilibrium, then there will be a shift in the equilibrium point. To determine in which direction this shift occurs, we use the Le Chatelier's principle, namely that the reaction favored will be the one that minimizes the change. So what we can do is use the graph to get clues about the type of reaction we are dealing with. Let's start by considering an increase in temperature, leaving all else constant. On this plot, that would be represented by moving from left to right along one of the constant pressure curves. On each of the curves provided, that would be a movement up along the curve. That means that an increase in the temperature leads to an increase in the yield. Moving left to right leads us to move upwards, and that represents increasing yield as we go up along the y-axis. As yield in this case refers to yield of compound Z, that means that the production of Z is favored when the temperature goes up. This means that the production of the Z compound cools the vessel to counteract the change, as per Le Chatelier's principle. Therefore, the forward reaction must be endothermic and delta H is greater than zero, i.e. heat energy is absorbed and more energy ends up in the chemical bonds. That eliminates options B and D as those are exothermic with delta H less than zero. If we now consider an increase in pressure, say from 10 to 50 megapascals, keeping all else constant, that would be represented on the plot as a movement from the topmost curve to the bottommost curve in a vertical manner. It is completely vertical as this would represent a constant temperature. Now, if we are moving down along the plot, that would mean the yield is going down. Therefore, an increase in pressure leads us to a decrease in yield. That means the production of the Z compound is not favored in this case. As per Le Chatelier's principle, that would imply the reverse reaction decreases the pressure. It is the favored reaction, while the forward reaction increases the pressure. In terms of additional clues to the equation we are looking for, that means that the production of Z in the forward direction should create more gas molecules compared to the reverse direction, which uses it up. More gas molecules in the same space would put more pressure on the container. So we want to find the option that increases pressure, or in other words, has more gas molecules on the product side compared to the reactant side. If we go through each option we have left, we can see that in option A, we have four reactant gas molecules compared to two product gas molecules. This would imply Z production decreases the pressure, which is the opposite of what we established for the forward reaction. Therefore, we can eliminate option A, and that means that option C is our answer. Just to double check that we do have the correct answer, we can see that on the reactant side, we have two gas molecules, while on the product side, we have three gas molecules, meaning that the production of Z increases the pressure and aligns with what we determined the forward reaction should be doing. This verifies that option C is the answer we are looking for. Moving on to the next question. Question 17 states, the following apparatus was set up in a temperature controlled laboratory. There is then a diagram of a beaker containing saturated copper sulfate and some solid copper sulfate at the bottom. Finally, a lid covers the beaker. Then the question states, excess sodium hydroxide is added to the beaker. Which row of the table correctly identifies the change in the copper sulfate solid mass and the color of the solution after several days. We then have a table with four rows representing options A through D and various options for what happens to the solid copper sulfate mass and color of the solution. So in this question, we need to consider what effect the introduction of a new solution will have on the existing setup of copper sulfate solution and solid. As with the mixing of any two solutions, ions from both solutions will interact and there is the possibility that a precipitate will be formed. Another possibility is that a common ion affects the solubility of another species of precipitate. In this case, we have the mixing of two solutions, copper sulfate and sodium hydroxide, which contain different ions from each other. So we can rule out a common ion. 
One thing to realize is that copper sulfate is generally soluble, so a lot of copper sulfate must have been added in order to saturate the solution. We can get a clue on this by looking at the solubility constants at the back of the exam. Although not an exhaustive list, copper sulfate is not found on this list, implying it is probably not insoluble and therefore soluble. However, one thing that we can find on this list is copper hydroxide. It is very insoluble and therefore when the copper sulfate and sodium hydroxide mix, the copper and hydroxide ions will form a solid precipitate. This will therefore reduce the amount of copper ions in solution. Originally the solution is blue in color, as indicated from options B to D, and this is due to the copper ions in the solution. If these copper ions are now going to form copper hydroxide precipitate, that means that the blue color of the solution will fade as more and more copper is removed. This eliminates options A and C as these two do not have the color of the solution fading. This therefore leaves us to choose from options B or D. The next thing to figure out is what happens to the solid copper sulfate. Does it have no change in its mass or does it actually decrease in mass? It turns out the loss of copper ions from solution leads to a decrease in copper sulfate solid. So option D is the answer. We can go through the logic here to understand why this is so. Firstly, the production of copper hydroxide solid reduces the copper ions in solution. With less copper ions, this means that more copper sulfate solid can dissolve, as the solution is no longer saturated. With more copper sulfate solid dissolving, this replaces the copper ions that were precipitated out. However, if more copper ions enter solution again, then that allows even more solid copper hydroxide to form taking us back to step one, and the process repeats again. The important point here is that copper hydroxide is for all intents and purposes insoluble, and therefore any copper ions that precipitate out to copper hydroxide solid do not come back out to solution. We can see that if steps one to three repeat, the overall effect will be a decrease in the mass of the copper sulfate solid, and that means that option D is the answer. To understand this a bit better, we can think back to how a saturated solution works on a microscopic level. If we have our saturated solution of copper sulfate with solid copper sulfate at the bottom of our beaker, what that means is that we have so much copper and sulfate ions floating around that at the same rate that the copper sulfate solid dissolves into solution, the highly concentrated copper and sulfate ions are turning back into a solid. If we now add sodium hydroxide into the solution, then that process of turning back to solid copper sulfate is interrupted. Instead, we get copper ions joining with hydroxide ions to form solid copper hydroxide as a precipitate. And that means we have another way that copper ions can form a precipitate. Except this time, the copper does not come back out into solution as it does with the copper sulfate. Although the copper ions no longer form solid copper sulfate, there is still a process of dissolution going on on the other side. With time, as more and more ions dissolve into solution and copper hydroxide solid grows, we will see a reduction in the mass of the copper sulfate solid. Therefore, the solid at the bottom of the beaker will continue to dissolve into solution, reducing the mass of the copper sulfate solid. And this reduction means that option D is the answer. The last question in this video is 18. Question 18 states, an aqueous solution of sodium hydrogen carbonate has a pH greater than seven and then asks, which statement best explains this observation? The options are A, liquid water is a stronger acid than the aqueous hydrogen carbonate ion. B, the aqueous hydrogen carbonate ion is a weaker acid than the aqueous carbonic acid. C, the aqueous sodium ion reacts with water to produce the strong base aqueous sodium hydroxide. Or D, the conjugate acid of the aqueous hydrogen carbonate ion is a stronger acid than liquid water. So in this question, we are dealing with a salt solution of sodium hydrogen carbonate, and this solution contains sodium and hydrogen carbonate ions. If we consider the first ion, sodium, then we know that if it forms sodium hydroxide, as implied by option C, then it would be a very strong base, leading it to dissociate again immediately. Therefore, this would have no effect on the pH, and we can eliminate option C. Now, if we consider the hydrogen carbonate ion, we need to remember or realize that it is amphiprotic. It can act either as an acid and donate a proton to form CO3 2 minus, or it can act as a base and accept a proton to form the H2CO3 molecule or carbonic acid. In this question, we are told that the pH is greater than seven, which means the hydrogen carbonate ion is acting as a base and accepting a proton. 
In this aqueous solution, the only thing for the hydrogen carbonate to accept a proton from is the H2O molecule. Our equation, therefore, would look something like this, with the water donating a hydrogen ion to the hydrogen carbonate, which forms the carbonic acid molecule. The hydrogen carbonate, therefore, is acting as the base. It accepts a proton from the water and therefore leaving behind a hydroxide ion. The water, on the other hand, is the acid donating the proton. Therefore, if in the presence of the hydrogen carbonate ion, the water donates a proton, it must be the stronger acid. If this were not the case, the proton would go in the other direction, as both the water molecule and hydrogen carbonate ion are amphiprotic, able to both donate and accept a proton under the right conditions. Because the water molecule is a stronger acid, it goes in the direction we see here, and that means that option A is our answer. However, we can take a bit of time here to understand why the other options are not the answer. Starting with option D, to form the conjugate acid of the hydrogen carbonate ion, we would need a proton to be accepted, i.e. we need hydrogen carbonate to act as a base, which would increase the pH. This is what we want. Again, this would come from the water. However, if the option says that H2CO3 is a stronger acid than water, then it would donate the proton it just picked up back to the water and therefore act as an acid. But that would then just reverse the process of making the H2CO3 in the first place, and we would be right back where we started. This does nothing to explain why our sodium hydrogen carbonate solution is basic or has a pH greater than seven. Therefore, this then eliminates option D. In option B, it is saying that the hydrogen carbonate ion from the salt is a weaker acid than H2CO3 or carbonic acid. This is true as the H2CO3 molecule much more readily donates a proton to water than the hydrogen carbonate ion. The ion being negatively charged holds onto the positive proton much more tightly. Although this is a true statement, it does not help us in explaining why we have a basic solution with sodium hydrogen carbonate. And we can eliminate option B as well. This just leaves option A as our answer, just as we have already determined. That concludes this video. Please tune in for the next set of videos from this exam. Thanks for watching and see you next time.